All right, Crypto, if you took your entire summer, the vacation, the summer flings, the <laughs> movies that you saw, and you tried to cram that into two hours, what are you going to pick? When I was 12? I don't know. <laughs> Already, right now, you've probably done more planning than the kids in this class did for their two hours. <laughs> All Indeed. right, guys, welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I know what you did last summer, Crypto. If you are new to the Codex Cantina, we are going heavy into detail in All Summer in a Day by Ray Bradbury. We like to bring out the themes and interpretations in this. If you're down for literature discussions like that, please hit the subscribe button. And as always, we start off with publication information. All Summer in a Day is a science fiction short story story by American writer Ray Bradbury. It was first published in March 1954 issue of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. So let's jump into this. We're on Venus, all clouds, all day. <laughs> Cloudy with a chance of rain? <laughs> Every seven years, you get to see the sun. That's the life for these kids on this planet. And you have quotes like, a thousand forests had been crushed under the rain. And I think this speaks to the imagery supporting that these kids are under a lot of oppression. And oppression is going to be kind of the main theme of today's story. Yeah. Every seven years, the sun comes out. And as a class of nine years old, and they were two the last time the sun came out, have never seen the sun, essentially. Except for one young girl who is going to be kind of the center focal point, the linchpin of the story. Our center of the universe, Margot, coming from Earth, right? Yeah, so she's going to be the one exception to the rule as she has memories of seeing the sun when she was a young girl back on Earth. So we have this quote about her. She was a very frail girl who looked as if she had been lost in the rain for years, and the rain had washed out the blue from her eyes and the red from her mouth and the yellow from her hair. She was an old photograph, dusted from an album, whitened away, and if she spoke at all, her voice would be a ghost. So some immediate descriptions that kind of put Margot into this box, much like this world being drained of sun, being drained of sunlight, and what does sunlight represent? Literature represents happiness and freedom, right? Here she is just being almost painted as more sullen compared to all the other children, but why? They all are deprived of sunlight. Why would Margot be the one that looks more like a washed out photo? Yeah, she takes Eeyore to the whole new level, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, since she's the one that has memories of the sun, she's the only one that knows what she's missing out on, in a sense, too. Yeah, exactly. I think that's one of the key elements of this story that Bradbury's trying to go with is the memory of something can sometimes be more detrimental. And it also sets her apart from the rest of society, right? So so she remembers the sun. None of these other nine-year-olds do. All the nine-year-olds play games together at recess. Margot does not. So it's instantly set up as this me versus the world, the same way we just recently did The Pedestrian by Ray Bradbury, where it's one guy does something different from the rest of society, therefore that person is at ends with society. A very common way for Bradbury to set up the story. Yeah, so little Margot is going to be on the outside or looking into what is, quote, the social norms of what children should be doing and she's making different choices because of her memory and the life that she lived has defined her differently than the lives of the children that were born on venus you think bradbury went up to people and interviewed them and was just like hey can you tell me about your hopes and dreams because i want to crush them like <laughs> <laughs> what is the thing that you most find beautiful right all right i'm gonna take that and pervert it to make you hate that thing you find so beautiful <laughs> oh you're into you're into science huh well i'm gonna make these kids hate science and not believe that the sun actually coming out right so so if society is against margot right here comes williamson who's representative of the class it's time for a little mock and lock right let's let's mock this girl and let's lock her up in time for so that way she can't see the sun coming out the sunrise if you will yeah and i think that here we we see that she is being persecuted for being different by her fellow classmates well, and that comes down to the, now our conversation of oppression and bullying. We talked earlier about how the ecosystem bullies the Venetians. Here we have the kids now bullying Margot for being different. And I think this quote, her eyes helpless, was a very powerful line for me to kind of feel bad for Margot. Because I think people can be bullied in different ways, whether it's in relationships, whether it's in a society or whether it's kids in a class, that feeling of measuring yourself in the eyes of another is very heartbreaking. And, and him pulling her eyes helpless out here really speaks to that for me because 
Margot, if you remember, is going to go back to Earth, right? All of the kids might be jealous of Margot as to why they are bullying her. We have that quote, they hated her pale snow face, her waiting silence, her thinness, and her possible future. Because they don't get to go back to Earth. They have to jam their entire summer into those two hours, as opposed to Margot, who will be leaving, living free out in the sun. So what do they do? They try to take her happiness away from her. They take that sun away from her by doing the little mock and lock and sticking her in the closet, right? Yeah, it's very heartbreaking. And this is where I had kind of hoped that the story was going to be going on a different route. And I thought that they were going to get their comeuppance and that she was going to pull a fast one on them. But it didn't turn out that way as I kind of hoped. And uh, the, the bad guy kind of wins here, which is really sad. But I guess that's a lesson that Bradbury was trying to make a point of. Is it, though? Um, let's Let's go through this a little bit slower, right? So... When I think of rain in literature, it typically represents cleansing, rebirth, unless it's like really heavy and downpouring and oppressive, and then in which case it's kind of an ironic usage. And we have a little bit of both in this story. If we view the rain as cleansing, what does it mean that all of the bullies, all of the kids that are oppressing Margot, don't go into the rain to be cleansed? What does it mean that they go out into the summer to have fun while they're specifically abusing one of their child? when they're childhood friends that would, in theory, haunt them for seven years, right? They've never seen the sun, so they don't know if it's a big deal or not. They go outside and experience the sun, and how how do they feel when they get into the sun? It makes them feel better and good. It said that it kind of rejuvenated them, and it's something that they never experienced before. And that was the first time that it was actually quiet, that there wasn't an oppressive sound upon them, too, coming back once more upon an oppressive symbol. The usage of sound finally stops oppressing these children for them to go outside and have some fun, too. Yeah, exactly. So you see this, like, release of tension happen. I think another thing we could talk about with the rain as well in the story, and I quote, In the center of it, cupped and huge, was a single raindrop. She began to cry, looking at it. They glanced quietly at the sun. Is this acid rain? Maybe what does this represent? The kids feeling remorse or guilt? Like, why is she crying? Yeah, I imagine a lot of readers can take this a different way. And, and, by, and by itself, it probably, you won't have an answer. My initial reaction was remorse for themselves, selfishly, right? These are kids that are thinking only for themselves, enjoying the moment of and for themselves while their classmate is locked up. They've forgotten completely about Margot in these entire section as they're celebrating outside. Not one time does any of these children think about Margot, for at least what the narrator tells us, right? Yeah, I guess I just thought, when I read it the first time, I thought, oh man, the rain is hitting them, and it's acid rain, and it's going to burn them and hurt them, and that's why they start running back in. Uh, but or, there doesn't seem to be any some negative consequence there. Or does it cleanse them too? Who knows? Yeah, maybe. so maybe for them, cleansing them and making them feel guilt is worse than a burn. I mean, that mental anguish over physical anguish. And and that's the exact turning point for these kids, too. Because when they come inside, we have the quote, they could not meet each other's glances. Their faces were solemn and pale. They looked at their hands and feet, their faces down. So we're almost getting like a script of how they should be acting if this were a play. But it doesn't ever describe. So we're, we have to extrapolate what the meaning of this is. And when you look down and you're not looking you know, in the eyes of someone, you typically are embarrassed and are not wanting to meet their eyes because you feel shame. Looking down is a submissive gesture that I think what we're meant to imply here is just after having finally experienced the sun for the first time to finally see why does Margot look like a washed out picture constantly? Because the sun is amazing. <laughs> so now when they come back in and they're like, oh crap, we lacked Margot in in the closet and she's not going to see the sun again until she returns to Earth, right? Now they realize the, the torture, the oppression that they've put onto Margot and have to face it when she comes out of the closet is how I would interpret that. Yeah, I also took it too, is that they're feeling shame and guilt and that she was right the whole time. I mean, she described the sun and Mm -hmm. how do you describe something like the sun to somebody that's never seen or experienced it? And then they finally now have these same memories that she has 
and they're like, crap, she was right, and I want to see the sun all the time, and we can't, and when something is so magnificent is taken away from you, it's really hard to cope with, and so now they're having a better understanding of her, and I think that they're able to empathize a little bit more with her, uh, and I think that with this, we see kind of the fruition of their guilt come about. Yeah, it's one of those things they say, it's easier to be wrong than right, but it's harder to admit that you were wrong instead of right. Like like going back and saying I did wrong is something you almost never see. And, and you can see it in apologies too that feel weak. It's because they're never owning up to their own actions. And here you have the kids that aren't even willing to look at their own actions. They won't even look at Margot. They're looking down at their feet, their, their feet with solemn faces. And even though they know that she gets to go back, they still feel bad because they know that they've done wrong. Because they could be bitter about it and be like, oh, well, you missed it this one time, but you're going to get to go back anyway and see it. And we, we're we going to be stuck here and never get to see it for another seven years. But they know that that doesn't matter. That's well, not the point of it. Exactly. And that's that's one of the problems of bullying is depriving someone else's happiness. Okay. That's not necessarily going to change your happiness in those moments, right? You might get a kick out of a thrill of domination, of, of domineering over someone. But if you can both enjoy the sun, bullying is a serious problem if you take away other people's happiness like that, right? But bullying is a problem in general. I don't mean to say it's not in some cases. But that's one of the main things that bullies don't see is that taking away happiness is something that doesn't even need to happen. Like that's not something that should give you pleasure. Yeah. Well, I think it's that jealousy idea, too, that comes hand in hand with bullying is I don't want somebody else to have something that I don't have myself. Right. And they get pleasure out of denying it for other people, which is which is the conversation piece that we have here today from Ray. Exactly. So very interesting story. I would love for you guys to leave either like a raindrop or a thunderstorm emoji down below if you enjoyed today's conversation. Now, Crypto, we're going to move into our ratings. We have kind of a strange flip of coming of age story here where instead of the hero coming of age it's almost like the rest of the class the rest of society comes of age to realize the the way that they've made this little girl feel ostracized from the rest of them and now they're gonna have to live with that for the next seven years or however long until they see the sun again knowing what they've deprived of someone what are you gonna rate this story rare time i'm gonna have to go with two different ratings uh i think analytically this is a really great story for bullying and the imagery and i love all the things you can talk about with memories and the power of memories uh the power of bullying the power of society cleansing of the rain this story is very rich especially for such a short piece but i didn't really enjoy the story that much so i'd say maybe analytically an eight but then for okay. enjoyment like a four okay because i wanted the story to end different i wanted margo mm. to to get them i wanted her like it was this diabolical plan that she let them lock her away and so that they would be late and getting out there and they would miss it themselves and she was like Mwahaha, this devious you know little kid getting back at the bullies but the bad guys kind of win, and I don't like that, so yeah, you I don't wanted, know. You wanted to write a different yeah. ending. Okay. I did want a different ending, but Braid Badbury is, I guess, nicer than me, and that's saying something, right? <laughs> to that point, so, though, by not allowing her to win, that that would undermine the value of conversation for bullying, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, for sure. By, for by sure. not allowing her to win, you can take this short story into a class and have a conversation about bullying a lot more easily than being than the bullies if she had one but like well she got it in the end to your earlier point of well she's going back to earth soon like like you can so easily justify bullying and that's what i think is part of the conversation that you need to have with with this piece oh for sure this is definitely not carrie <laughs> if stevie king wrote this she would have got you know the come uppings for the kids but uh, I, I think that the, the story is perfect in that regards for teachable moments, as I said, analytically. But enjoyment, yeah, yeah. I I like the mean Stephen King ending better. You wanted to carry. <laughs> you wanted to carry. Um, what, what do you call it? To go nuts. Um, catharsis. No. You 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 didn't yeah, have any yeah. purging of the bad feelings for the bullies. I get that. I get that. 
Uh, yeah. I'm just going to go with one rating with a seven where I vary differently also as well as enjoyment versus analytical. But I think this is a very strong piece probably to have a conversation with your students in a literature class about bullying. I think it's good. Awesome. Well, all right, guys, if you enjoyed today's conversation, we post videos two to three times a week. If you're down for literature discussions like this, please consider hitting that subscribe button. We'd love to talk to you on the journey. Una out. Peace.